The All Things XR Podcast. Where you can get the best AR VR analyzers from the biggest names in the field. Hi everyone, welcome to the All Things XR Podcast, I'm Mochtaba. In today's episode, we talk about WebXR and the implementation of AR and VR on the web with Blair McIntyre, Principal Research Scientist at Mozilla. This conversation was recorded on April 18th. Without further ado, let's get to my conversation with Blair McIntyre. Hi Blair. Hi. Thanks very much for joining the All Things XR Podcast. Oh, thank you. Glad to be here. Can you tell us more about yourself? Uh, sure. I've been working in the area of XR since the early 90s. Uh, I was a graduate student, and then I was a professor, and still am a professor at Georgia Tech, uh, where I have been since 1998. Um, I've been at Mozilla three years, and but I've been working on augmented reality primarily and the web since about 2009. Uh, I started working on it back then in the context of this Argon project at Georgia Tech where we were looking at how you might expose augmented reality onto the web. And this was before WebVR or WebXR existed. Uh huh. Great. So for our first question, um, what is WebXR? So WebXR is the first uh, standard or proposed standard uh, in the context of the immersive web working group or community group uh, at the W3C. So it's an attempt to provide an API, a low-level JavaScript API that exposes the platform capabilities. Uh, so what you need in order to be able to render VR on a modern VR display and have it work well with the system or render AR on a modern AR display. Uh, so it's aimed at at letting you use all the existing things that you're familiar with in the web, WebGL and JavaScript and so on, but render such that it works uh, and takes advantage of the hardware on on the various augmented reality, virtual reality displays that are coming out. Mm -hmm. So XR right now covers technologies like VR, AR, MR, etc. What XR and WebXR stands for? Uh, it actually stands for... Uh, depending on who you talk to, uh -huh. all of the above. So I think for many of us, it really means any of the R's, augmented reality, mm -hmm. mixed reality, virtual reality, mm -hmm. whatever. Uh, and the, the term in the context of the standard came about in response to web VR. So uh, three or four years ago, Mozilla uh, started uh, working on web VR and other companies joined in. Um, and when we were working on WebVR 2.0 to try to fix some of the issues with the first version and get it closer to a standard, we decided as a group to expand it to include AR instead of having another standard for AR. And uh, at that point, thought, well, should it be MR? Should it be XR? Sh whatever. And we just decided to use XR as a sort of stand-in for any of the possible ways of mixing, uh, creating sort of 3D immersive experiences using using the web. So why actually web matters in the world where we have apps? So I think the web matters because of the limitations and constraints of the app stores. So on the web, you can go and create a website, put up whatever you want. There's no friction. There's no approval. Um, and, and a lot of the information and a lot of the companies and systems we've come to depend on grew up because of the open, accessible, un unregulated nature of the web. And so uh, as a concrete example, I had a student who worked at the uh, CDC with the uh, infectious diseases uh, group, and she was really interested in how can we help stem the spread of STDs among teenagers. And so what she wanted to do was create uh, an AR game that tried to teach them things about STDs and proper condom use and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And so we actually created a, a little augmented reality game uh, aimed at, at middle school kids. There is no chance that could ever be published on any app store 
uh, for any platform. And 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 it, it actually goes beyond that, right? Because even if it could be published, a kid couldn't down the kids who need that information would be hesitant to download it or wouldn't be able to because their parents might have to approve it. And if their parents would approve of that, then they've probably already taught them about, about mm-hmm. these issues. And they might be embarrassed to have that on their phone if their friends see it. And so so that's just sort of one small thing. You can think about political things. You can think about just the the ability to express yourself. The other side of apps, I think, is is that apps have to be polished, right? So the threshold to produce and get approval to distribute something on on iOS or Steam or something like that is really high. Yeah. And and if I want to do a little experiment or uh, create some demonstrations for a, a class I might be teaching, I'm going to be teaching a class to middle school kids at the end of um, May where I want them to experiment with telling stories uh, about meaningful things on their school campus, things to them, uh, using augmented reality. So can you create a story where you walk around campus and people could learn about the school? There's no way these things these things could get, get published and distributed. Sure, I could take an AR authoring app and create it and be able to show it, but the content then is locked into that app. It might not be shareable. It might not be discoverable. So, so I think the things we think about in terms of information access and getting, getting knowledge and sharing like Wikipedia and going and Googling things, none of those will exist uh, or would exist without the web because they're central to it. And I think the same thing will be true of AR and VR. Uh-huh. Great. What are the best use cases for web VXR? Um, so I think initially, so that's a great question. And I think initially we're going to see a lot um, uh, in a few different areas. On handhelds, which is where, hand, like phones, Android, iOS, it's where I think a lot of a lot of people have access to AR right now and will for the foreseeable future. We're not going to have consumer-focused uh, AR head mounts mm-hmm. sort of in the next few years. Um and so we'll see a lot of stuff there of the sort you would imagine on phones, but but coupled with the web. So you go to the web, you search for something, you want to get information about a shop you're standing in front of, uh, a product you're standing in front of in a store, uh, a monument you're standing in front of in a park, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, if you go to that website, the idea that I could get the two information in 2D that I want, but oh, that that web operator could also add a little link to, to switch it over into AR mode, right? And so there... Uh, I might see additional characters in a story related to this this monument, or I might be able to see kind of instructions or details about the product I'm standing in front of at the store, um, or uh, you know all of the information about the restaurant sort of spread out in space around me. And so I think we'll see a lot of that of people enhancing existing web content with the option to do a little AR or do a little VR. Uh, initially on, on handhelds, um, on on desktops uh, or on VR devices, either the standalone devices or uh, uh, desktop ones, I think we'll see a lot of experimentation. Right? People are still the area is still new. People are still trying to figure out how to create successful VR experiences, and so a lot of a lot of that work is happening with things like Unity and Unreal and being published uh, in app stores, but some of the more experimental stuff, some of the things that are less big budget, less polished, uh, can really be hosted and have a great, great home on the web. I also think that we'll see a lot of enterprise stuff, right? So when you go and talk to people uh, who run, you know, the IT departments of big companies, uh, the idea of pushing apps, lots and lots of apps, lots and lots of app updates to tens of thousands of computers around a business is is overwhelming. And if we can push out a web browser that uh, has uh, WebXR uh, capabilities on it, so say Firefox Reality for VR and eventually AR onto you know your VR devices or your HoloLens 2 or your Magic Leap, then uh, all of the AR capabilities or VR capabilities that a company might want to deploy to their workers could be deployed through the same channels that they currently use to deploy the rest of their infrastructure, many of which are deployed as web apps, right? So I think enterprise will be 
actually in the near term a lot bigger, especially for augmented reality than consumer applications. Oh, that's an interesting idea. I think I could see some people doing it. Um, if you're developing an, so there's sort of two paths to something like that, right? Uh, one of them is you develop the whole app with web technologies, but you package it up as an app and ship it. Mm -hmm. The other, uh, in which case having a bit of it on the web would be pretty easy. The other would be, uh, you've developed the app with unity or unreal or something like this. It's a little harder to do that then. Um, although, uh, those companies are, are, getting better, I think, at, mm -hmm. at uh, exporting to the web. And I mean, I think it's, it's, it's feasible, um, especially if there's an app that's better suited for uh, uh, the app stores than it is, say, for the web. I mean, one of the interesting things for me is to think about what, what are those things that the web will be good at and things that it'll be bad at, right? And if we think about games, especially big, high-budget games, which have... 70 gigabytes of content you have to download in order to, to install it on your, your PC, or your Xbox. It's, it's hard to imagine in the very near term that those kinds of games will be sort of amenable to web delivery, right? There's a lot mm -hmm. of work that we need to do in order. If we're, it's a lot of work that needs to be done to, to do better at splitting apps, to do better at streaming and all that sort of stuff which, uh, uh, you know, downloading upfront is probably a better solution right now. And, and, you know, all the issues around monetization and so on, if you're going to charge 70 or 80 bucks upfront for something, it's, it's a lot easier to manage that and for the people to manage it if they're downloading it. Uh huh. Um, so other than Mozilla, what are the most important companies that uh, we have to keep an eye on in the WebXR field? Um, I mean, kind of all the, all the obvious people, right? So all of the platform people, so Apple, Google, Microsoft, Oculus, Samsung, um, Ma Magic Leap, and then, uh, are the big ones, right? So those yeah. are the people who are, who are working and heavily involved in, uh, in the platform and hopefully if people I've forgotten will forgive me. <laughs> um, there's a lot of people involved. Uh, and working on it right now, but then there's, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to say who'll end up be, being big on the web. You can look at, at sites right now that are trying to uh, create businesses around, around the web, whether it's e-commerce, uh, people like, uh, commerce or Shopify, whether it's, uh, uh, repositories like Sketchfab that are using or trying to use, uh, the web to deliver, to deliver XR features it it it's we don't know right now who will who will bust out and uh and become a sort of major player uh-huh uh, so how about the startups um i mean it's it's hard to i i don't know right it since webxr isn't out yet there's not a lot of startups focusing on webxr uh, based delivery. There's companies working on enabling technologies, right? Mm -hmm. Like the, all the various sensing companies like 6D.ai and, yeah. and, and so on. But those aren't directly influencing the web yet because they're, they're aiming more at, at the platforms themselves. Um, I mean, there's some companies, uh, like eighth wall that are building computer vision technology that runs inside the web browsers really well. Yeah, they're and, great. And it's really easy to see, you know, when, when the immersive web as a platform, so WebXR device API being one part of it and eventually other, other standards on the web get to the point that, that a company like eighth wall could take advantage of, of more of the, the low level information that's, that would be available, then that will just help them. Right. So uh -huh. they'll be able to do the great stuff they're doing, but do it better. Um, and, but it'll also see other, other companies springing up to, to do similar things. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I get it. Um, so when we talk about web, we usually think of its technologies as open source and cross platform technologies. Is it also right. true in WebXR? 
Right now it is, right? So this is actually sort of the big tension and difficulty of creating these standards, which is how do we build some, define something that's going to be implemented in all the web browsers and all the platforms such that uh, it, it, it exposes as much as it can of what these platforms can do because people want that, but also uh, can work everywhere, right? Mm-hmm. So we can't go and ex- necessarily say pick a, a, a piece of technology like um, the way ARKit does plane or image or object tracking, right? So, yeah. or, or the way that uh, ARKit defines maps or ARCore defines maps, um, for relocalization and, and persistence until those companies open up the technology so that I could create a map on, on an Android phone and, and use it on an iOS device or on a HoloLens or a, a Magic Leap, it's going to be hard to standardize and share that kind of information. So I think the first, the first version of WebXR is going to be aimed at or is aimed at the, for people who haven't gone and looked at it, is aimed at the very uh, essential parts, right? So motion tracking, device, uh, uh, a device abstraction for input. Uh, we'll have some hit testing because that's really important in, in augmented reality. And we're talking about other things uh, for, for sort of down the road, even in the near term, like anchors and computer vision and how do we expose world uh, geometry and all those sorts of things. The big, the big t- difference between the web and native is the attention paid to user privacy and security, right? So when, when I download an app on the app store and run it on my, my iPhone or run it on my HoloLens, there's certain bits of technology that I have to give it permission to access, right? Like my location, mm-hmm. access to the camera. But if you're running an app, on the HoloLens, uh, and and you're running it in your house, and you've walked around your house with the HoloLens on. That app gets the full model of yeah. the entire space that it's in, right? And, yeah. and there's no no permissions there, and and it gets sort of real time updates to this model and the sensing and and in your hand tracking and all that sort of stuff because that's that's sort of what defines doing an AR app on on the HoloLens. And the same for Magic Leap and 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 Air Kit and Air Core and all these things. And and so the platforms are biased heavily towards exposing as much technology w- without exposing things like cameras or 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 location without permission. Uh, whereas on the web, you know, you click on a link and mm-hmm. you don't know where you're gonna end up. You don't know who hosts it, you don't know what it is until you get there. Right? Yeah, yeah. And and so there's a lot of attention paid towards making that action of clicking the link as as comfortable as it is in the 2D world, right? Like I on a web page, I might hover over a link to see what it is. Generally, I don't worry too much if it seems like a reputable link about clicking something that comes up in Google uh, and running it. Uh, and so there's this tension between there where the web – a lot of what we talk about in the immersive web community group is uh, these questions of security threats and privacy threats and so on. And how do we make, make it so that doing things on the web and AR and VR is sort of the one place that you can go with this technology where you, you can feel a certain confidence that your privacy isn't, isn't necessarily being violated. Yeah. 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 Totally. I agree. It's going to be a huge deal, right? Right now, this is like, I could go off on this for a long time. Right now, the devices are relatively, uh, you know, rare. Not a lot of people have HoloLenses and Magic Leaps and so on. And people who do have them are primarily researchers or people in industry. And when these sorts of devices become consumer devices or when there's really widespread pervasive use of VR devices, which probably will happen sooner, Mm -hmm. At that point, there's there's a, a motivation and a benefit for bad actors to start trying to take advantage of them, right? Like they did with the web, like they do with with viruses and so on on native platforms, and and so some of the stuff that we're seeing right now in terms of the data that's given to all applications hasn't been abused just because nobody cares yet, right? Like there's no bad actors that really care because there's hardly anybody using them. Yeah. And I think that's going to become a bigger issue in the future. Uh, and I think that's 
the web has the potential to be not just a place or the best place for privacy, but I can see a future where like the only place that you do most of your AR VR explorations is on the web because the native platforms expose too much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I get it. Um, so Blair, one of the most important things for a technology to grow is making it available and easy for developers to create content for. Um, right now, what are the ways that developers can dive into and get started with WebXR? I think the best way to approach it is probably uh, based on your background, mm -hmm. right? If you're coming at it from a web development viewpoint, like your experience front end or full stack web developer with a lot of knowledge of, of sort of the web workflows and how HTML, CSS, JavaScript works, um, you know, coming in via something like a frame, which is a Dom based, uh, uh, wrapper around a 3d library is if you're comfortable with HTML, that that's a sort of great place to, to sort of do your first experiments because it's super easy, right? I taught, uh -huh class of high school kids who'd never done any programming. Uh, I taught them a little HTML, taught them a little A-frame, and they could make little things. <laughs> Great. Right? And, um, and, you know, A-frame has its limitations uh, uh, for sort of ramping up, but it's really great for, for us sort of simple things. Um, and we and others are working on sort of other approaches to how you might expose um, – XR into into the DOM into the web in a comfortable way. Then, um, if you're you know coming at it as a as a JavaScript sort of low level programmer, there's sort of a host of environments you could go and look at sort of high level tools like Play Canvas or Sumerian or Babylon, um, which are sort of at different levels but have more of a Unity like feel to them, right? Sort of they have a graphical APIs and or graphical UIs for creating and, and, and defining content and mixing it with scripts and so on. Um, at a lower level, uh, you know, 3JS is, is, is really popular. So there's a lot of uh, uh, activity around sort of working at the, the JavaScript or uh, TypeScript or whatever language you like level um, and, and working on, on, at that sort of programmer level with a scene graph and so on. And of course you can also, if you're really, uh, uh, experienced, you can obviously go down all the way to, to working with raw WebGL, but you know, most people work at a slightly higher level. Yeah. Um, you know, the interesting thing I think that's going to happen in the near over the next while is, uh, when more of the 3d graphics capabilities, more WebGL and so on is exposed into uh, WebAssembly. Then uh, I think the world really opens up for non-web people, right? So right now with WebAssembly, you can take any language that you're comfortable with, um, you know, C++, Rust, C, uh, whatever, and compile it into WASM. Um, right now, I don't think, and I hope, hope this is still true, uh, you can't access all of, say, WebGL or, or that sort of stuff from a WebAssembly package. But, but this is... This is the kind of thing that the, the WASM community and, and the web community in general is, is interested in solving. Um, because, you know, eventually what we'd like, right, is that whatever language or, or tools you're, you're comfortable with, you could build and target the web as a platform. Um, and so I think there's a lot of motion uh, in that space as well, a lot of activity there. That's mm -hmm. worth checking out if you're interested in it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, in a future where we all wear AR glasses, if the WebXR grows and gets the exact features as the native AR and VR apps, can we call it then the end of app stores? And how do you see the ecosystem of apps in that future? Um, I think, so it's easy to imagine the end of either, mm -hmm. right? Depending on how things go, the end of the web or the end <laughs> of the app stores. Yeah. Um, it's, it's hard to imagine them going away entirely. Uh, you know, in some ways a web browser is still still an app um, regardless of how well it, it uh, how it looks and behaves. Now you can imagine um, a future where uh, you buy your device, you put it on and you can just, it, it, it's not clear you're using an app store, just going to a website and you go to a website and it, it, you know, you go to a place on the internet and the associated app infrastructure gets installed for you 
And that could all be built using, you know, Wasm and, and web tech, or it could be built in other ways. Um, it's, it, I don't think it, so it's just really hard to say, right? I don't think the app stores are going to go away anytime soon. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's, it's simple things like downloading and caching and managing like the applications themselves, right? If you have infinite network bandwidth and infinite memory on the device and, and all that, then yeah, you could imagine just doing everything on the web. Um, you know, there's a lot of work that needs to be done on things like web payments and uh, authentication so that people could actually run entire uh, uh, businesses and so on using the pure web itself as yeah. opposed to selling things through the app stores or selling subscriptions. Um, and so so I think there's a lot of the things that were we that are problems or limitations of the current web with respect to competing directly head to head with app stores. And those in some ways are exactly the same on, on the immersive web with the addition that you're mobile, right? So yeah. it's, it's sort of like, what are the limitations you find when you're going to try to use a website on a mobile browser? A lot of those limitations will carry over whether it's, you know, the need for connectivity and or whatever it is. Um, so working on our um, browsers has been something that we were promised with browser apps, especially after technologies like WebGL. Some expected that many of the apps will be on browsers, but web apps never took off as we expected. Do you think that AR and VR and WebXR will be the same? And can AR and VR and the web really compete with uh, developing platforms like Unity? Um I think a lot of, I think they can, I think where the, the biggest difference will be, will be because of the much more invasive nature of these devices in terms of the sensing and what it, what apps can sense and, and about you and the world around you, people around you and so on. And so, so I think there's a potential for there to be a bit of a shift toward the web, uh, unless the native platforms do a lot more at protecting uh, uh, privacy and helping users understand and control what information apps get about them. Um, but the other, th I also think that with AR in particular, there's going to be a lot more sort of ephemeral information that you want to access, mm -hmm. right? Like the things like I'm standing in front of X, whatever it is, and I want to know something about it. Yeah. Um, and so I want, you could imagine, okay, well, I could just write an app that, that, people can put content into and, and it, 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 uh, lets me do stuff. And people tried that years ago with, with mobile, right. With things yeah. like layer and wicked and all those sort of app AR browser. Exactly. Things. And, you know, at some point you, you're, those are competing directly with the web. And when I talked to people who, who built content for layer and, 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 and so on, the problem was it was very hard to go beyond very simple things because those, those platforms did not offer the full programmability and full like capabilities of something like the web. And they, they because and they, but they had to try. And so the platforms, there was that tension, right. And, mm -hmm. and the ability to uh, uh, just put stuff up and deploy it and so on becomes much more, much more relevant and interesting. And, and with mobile where now it's not just, keyword search to find things on like on the 2d web but now you have location and context and who's around you and and, and so on and so the ability for me to go in a certain place and say do a location-based search on all the information that's available mm -hmm. which i could say do on google maps right now right and uh and bring it back to me and now i can discover things and you know, you go and write a little story and put it in, say, Times Square about some show that you saw. I mean, it's a blog post, right? And I might discover that mobily, um, but it's not something I'm going to want to install an app to access, right? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And so I think there's that potential. Now, the social media platforms will take some of that. You could imagine um, big uh, content publishing platforms trying to target apps, but it's, it's, 
it's hard to imagine that like I'm going to access all of the web through a WordPress app or, uh, or some other app, right? It's much more likely that I'll just use a browser and people will publish their content on the web. So I think that the big thing that, that, I think we need to pay more attention to or people, the big opportunities I think in the near, near future are going to be related to finding interesting ways of integrating AR and VR content into existing web publishing models, right? So if I could create a blog on wordpress.com and use some tools to create sort of some AR content, some VR content, whether it's like something like play canvas or, or Sumerian, or it's something just like a little three JS or a frame thing. If I can really easily at publish those bits of content along with all my other 2d content or audio content, right? If you could, if you could do take say a little a AR or VR demo that I'd made and have it linked and integrated into the podcast when you publish it, right? Uh -huh. Then that opens up lots of really interesting opportunities for Absolutely. people to create and share and consume content. That's just going to be really hard to replicate with apps. Um, because so many people are using the web publishing platforms for for uh, a lot of creative content right now. So that that I think will be like the big thing, right? If we can figure out how to make it easy for people to create and share content in the context of what they already do, then the web as a as a vehicle and a platform for certain kinds of content, right? Yeah, can take off. But those, you know, People aren't necessarily going to publish the next Beat Saber or uh, 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 Overwatch using the web just because it's the web, but but they might publish, you know, uh, a thing like Beat Saber that was developed and, and I put my prototypes up and eventually I just delivered it this way because because that's where people uh, uh, found it. Um, so I think it, it we'll see. We'll see. <laughs> yeah, um, you are someone that has been in AR field more than 99% of the people working in this field right now. Um, how the vision for an augmented future has been changed in these decades? Um, I think, you know, way back when we started working on this stuff, it was very kind of task focused, right? Can we build anything? We had no, no clue about how this content might be distributed, how what everybody had this vision in sci from science fiction and so on of walking down the street and being surrounded by information. Uh -huh. Right. Yeah. Um, but I mean, the web didn't even exist back when I started doing AR. Right. Mm. And, um, and that came along. And so there was in the early two thousands, there was a bunch of us who were thinking about, Oh, we could somehow use the web and, you know, the semantic web was starting to appear and people were trying to figure out how to deliver structured information. Um, but I don't think people still had a strong idea of how we would actually, practically speaking, create and deliver content and information on these platforms. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think the ch things that have changed have been a function of how the world changed with us, right? I was talking to somebody and said, you know, 10 years ago, I, I took my son to uh, L.A. last weekend to go see uh, a bunch of live Overwatch League uh games at the at the blizzard arena and you know first of all 10 years ago if you told me i'd be taking my son across the country to go and see other people play video games <laughs> yeah um i would have thought that's insane yeah. but 10 years ago i also would have if you had said that like one of the biggest uses of the web is people watching other people play video games on a video streaming service like twitch i also would have thought wow that's crazy um and and so i think things will be will continue to evolve i mean right now i think a lot of visions of this information stem from social media the idea of oh i could be surrounded by little bits of information tweets posts whatever mm. um or the uh analog analogy you know what you see when you go to google maps and do a search and find all this information um and but i, I think people still don't have a strong sense of how will when i walk down the street and I want to see a bunch of information around me. I want to have that dream. Where Where is that information coming from? Who's managing it? How is it being chosen, uh, presented to me? How do I interact with it? I mean, it's not going to be one big soup of information, right? There will be no AR cloud, no mirror world. There might mm -hmm. be... 
tens of thousands of mirror world. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and they're like, they're Facebook, Google, Amazon, mm-hmm. all those big things. They're your podcast website. They're yeah. my blog, right? And and so I'll pull these bits of content in and out, and there'll be aggregators and so on. Um, so that I think has changed. Also, the technology is just like I could not have imagined the technology in the Magic Leap or Hololens to devices when I was a graduate student. It's just, I mean, I can kind of imagine it. People were working on some of those technologies even back then, but it's just like, and it, it's hard to imagine what it is like now and what the constraints are. So um, things will keep changing. I don't think anybody really has any strong, any, I don't think anybody knows how we, we, what the ecosystem will look like, what the app, shell like what the experience of being in a hololens or in a magic leap or some future device and walking down the street i don't think we have any convincing path toward what that would actually look like in terms of software implementations and how you create and share content and so on um i can envision a version of that that is based on when i'm walking down the street the only thing i see is web right as i see channels i've subscribed to and content i've subscribed to because that's a platform that I, I feel safe going into new spaces with, but it might be that the shell takes over for that, right? The equivalent of the HoloLens shell or the magic leap shell and the web can publish into it. So I might see a lot of the content coming from the web, but it might also be coming from apps. Right. And so it's, it's just, it's totally unclear. Yeah. 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 I remember myself, my first AR app, it was when um, there were no iPhone or Android phones. It was on Adobe Flash. People could go to my uh, personal website, put my um, business card in front of their webcam, and uh, see my resume. That was oh, all. Cool. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That was my first. Yeah, no, AR I remember. App. Yeah, I remember <laughs> the uh, the the Flash based uh, 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 business card uh, apps. They yeah. were they were pretty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, Blair, um, you are someone who is um, both an academic person and also work in a top tech company. How the academic atmosphere is different from a place like uh, Mozilla? Wow, that's that's uh, in some ways a hard question to answer. <laughs> so what are, you, what are you thinking about when you ask that? Right. So, so, so it's funny working at, in some ways, working at Mozilla is sort of somewhere between those. So Mozilla is an amazing company to work for. Uh And part of, part of it is for me at least is that, um, as a nonprofit, we need to make money and, and survive. Right. Mm -hmm. So we have to worry about, about that, but our goals are not, our goals are based on achieving the mission of the company, right? So mm-hmm. keeping the web open, healthy, safe, accessible. And so the, the the things we will do and the way we approach the work and everything is is different than I think a lot of companies who are, are focused sort of more directly on on products uh, for for business sake. So so it's hard for me to – so I don't actually know what it's like to work at a Google, Microsoft, Amazon, Samsung, wow. whatever. Um, but even, even there in the split, I mean – for most of my career, I was working on uh, prototyping and building tools so other people could prototype what AR might be useful for, how it might be used, uh, uh, interaction techniques, all of the sort of experience of augmented reality. That kind of work is not really, you know, that's not going to be the kind of work I would do in the academy going forward, mm-hmm. right? Because it's here. Anybody can play with that sort of stuff. And, and so I think the diff- the big difference in, in the academy versus, uh, uh, working in industry is, is that time horizon and the things that are appropriate and worthwhile working on in the academy, you really need to be working on sort of, a uh, figuring out things, uh, that are really generating new knowledge and creating a new and, and, and answering questions and and understanding the world around us or the future or how technologies really work with with people and so on. In industry, those 
those questions are important, but only insofar as they help you figure out how to develop products. Yeah. Right. So, so I think there is, there's a relationship between the two and I think both sides are really interested in understanding where to go and where we should go and how technology is affecting us. Um, but the focus is different. Um, you know, and things go slower in the academy, right? Yeah, when yeah, I, yeah. I, I joke with people that it's like, okay, you get an idea, you write a research grant, half a year later, you find it. If you get the research grant, then you can start working on it. You know, you, you think in terms of projects that are PhD student level. So they're like three to five year long. Um, and so it's a very different kind of work because in, in industry, yeah, you're thinking about three to five years in the future as your, as your plan, but you're also going to go through a whole product life cycle by the time I get that grant and have a student start working on a project. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it, it's really the, the immediacy and the, 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 the feedback. I mean, working at Mozilla on the web right now is kind of the, the best place to be in the XR world because we're, the web is important. If the web goes away, uh, you know, freedom of information goes away. Uh -huh. Um, and, uh, and, and we're working on things in the context of this industry that's changing at a, at a phenomenal pace. Right. Mm -hmm. And so it's, 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 yeah, it's, it's just different. Um, so Blair, um, uh, there's this privacy issue um, that and a challenge for AR companies as we go over the AR cloud. Um, what do you think about that? So when people talk about the AR cloud, they're, they're often talking about sort of two different things conflated together. One is the, the idea of building uh, a mirror of the physical world, it might not be a geometric mirror, but it's like enough to let you, as you walk through the world with a device, track, tell where you are, be able to localize yourself in the world. And the other is sort of a cloud of content, like all that content that's going to exist and be aligned with the world. The first one is, I think, what many people mean. And, and there's sort of an interesting appeal there for a lot of small companies, especially, right? So, if I'm going to be able to walk down the street, put information there, have someone else put it there and have it remain there over time, have you walk up, stand beside me and we both look at the same thing, we've got to be able to localize ourselves with much higher precision than we'll ever get with GPS. Yeah. Um, and, and so the path that a lot of people have gone down is oh, we can use this sort of slam, the simultaneous localization and mapping technologies that are in you know, that are underneath air kit and air core and HoloLens Magic Leap. We could use similar technologies to build a dynamic model of the world as people look around and use AR devices and send that off to the cloud, update it, take all the info from everybody. And over time, you could build this map of the world so that anybody goes anywhere. We can use it for precise localization. And so we, we can start having persistent experiences, shared experiences and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. And there's a really strong appeal to that. The problem comes in with the sort of uh, uh, crowdsource nature of it, right? If you are exactly. walking down the street in front of my house, you're in a place where, you know, Google Street Maps has, has images where any, you're in a public place. If you walk into my house, how do we know, how can we, how can I as a homeowner or, or a private person prevent you from building contributing a model of the inside of my house to this cloud, right? And there's no way to do it if it's just a pure background crowdsourced nature. And so, um, and that's, that's bad, right? Because it's not just privacy. It's things like if you walk into someone's business and go and you're a repair person, you go in the back, you've now built a potentially built a model of someone's private company, which might have very sensitive information. Exactly. Now, you, it could be the case that this information could be stored in a format that uh, or people will put forth that it could be stored in a format that isn't a model and couldn't be reconstructed. But I find that really hard to believe, because if you can localize from it, you can somehow reconstruct it using sort of uh, uh, big algorithms over time, lots of data. It's hard to envision that you couldn't uh, construct some of this stuff. Um, so I think as a community and, and so on, we need to sort of address this issue head on. Um, you know, there's, there have been proposals. I, I've 
written things, other people have written things uh, for things like, oh, well, it would actually be okay to crowdsource and collect this information potentially in public spaces, right? The kind of places that Google, Microsoft, Apple uh, uh, drive their cars, do map, street mapping data and so on. If you could, Google actually had an interesting uh, blog post uh, of technology they're working on to use the street map images yeah, yeah. for localization in the street and then use the local uh, uh air core technology to go off of that potentially into private places. If you built a system like that, that combined sort of public data that could be kept up to date, aggregated and so on with private data on your private device that is not shared back, then a lot of the privacy concerns start to go away, right? If I walk from my front front driveway into my house, walk everywhere in my house and the map on my device on my head mount is private to that device is not shared but it's linked back to the to the street so that i know precisely where i am in the world while i'm inside my house because of that connection that's fine and if i invite you into my house and you walk through you have pr that data your own set of data that's been aggregated onto your device we can reasonably expect that we could now have a shared experience uh, and we could even refine things in a in a person to person way without exposing all of the information, say, in the private parts of my house that I don't invite you in. So so I think there's there's potentials for that. The pushback and and it's understandable is that are we willing to cede control of this uh, whole infrastructure to the big companies as the base? Right. Uh -huh. Yeah. Because handcrafting those public data sets is a huge amount of work, right? Google mm -hmm. has invested and, and so on has invested huge amounts of work. I mean, maybe there's a way that more companies could team up with something like OpenStreetMap and or a different nonprofit or public repository of data to start collecting and, and managing a public data set there, uh, much like OpenStreetMap has done for, for mapping. Um, Again, it's such a hard problem that it's hard to get your head around. You know, when you think about how long it's taken to get OpenStreetMap or Google Maps to the state they're in and how fast we want to get to having mobile AR, there, it, 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 I think it's hard to convince people that it's worth the wait. But I think uh, we need to. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. As we talk about these issues, um, one thing that automatically comes into mind is blockchain. What do you think about that? I'm not. It's funny. I'm not sure how blockchain fits into all of this. So blockchain is great for for uh, uh, validating, you know, ownership or contributions or whatever. But it's also not great for privacy, right? Because if you contribute stuff to the blockchain, like uh, bits of maps or something, you're forever associated with it. Yeah. Um, no way to get it out. So, so I think for I, I'm not a fan of. I've never seen any proposal I've 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 thought was viable for using blockchain for this sort of geospatial data management. Um, and and I mean it's really so people have talked about it, it's like oh I could you know somehow assert my ownership of this space, my home that I'm in right now. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and potentially use technology like blockchain to, 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 to authenticate and validate that. But how, how do I, where do I go with that? Right. So I, so I have ownership, but does this mean I'm the only one who can give people the rights to access data in my home? What about my kids? If they invite their friend over and they want to play an AR game together, how do they have the rights? Does, do you have the right to to do stuff if you can, if I invite you into my house? What happens if I sell my house, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, and different countries in the world have different uh, levels of of sophistication around managing public records and who owns what and and so on. I mean, do can I reasonably require everybody in the world to assert digitally on some website control over? the digital mirror of their space. I mean, we can't get people to, to pay attention to privacy settings in, in, on their phones or in a browser, right? It's like yeah. that you can't add a bunch of busy work to manage the digital world. Nobody will do it. And so, uh, so it's not clear how you digitally manage this. Um, 
and once the information's out there, it's out there, right? So, so I, I think it has to be a much more opt-in um, uh, situation where, by default, nothing in your private spaces is, is aggregated and shared, and yeah, that'll limit certain experiences, right? And I think we have to be willing up front to say, yeah, it'll limit certain experiences, but that's a good thing, not a bad thing. <laughs> Yeah, well, Blair, um, it was an honor having you on the All Things XR podcast. Thanks very much. Oh, thank you for having me. It was a pleasure.